and uh, it's a pleasure to me to introduce you, uh, Filippo Spiga, that uh, actually started to work in MIPC uh, with me many years ago during uh, his uh, master uh, master degree. Then he moved uh, ar around the world, <laughs> uh, from Ireland, uh, then uh, to UK, from Cambridge, and now he's recently joined ARM. And he will uh, he will uh, talk uh, us about uh, what are the ARM plan and the co-design. Uh, let's say uh, interaction they they would like to to make with our uh, communities in order to plan for next generation IPC platform. Thanks, Carlo. So, um, so thank you for inviting me as a harm. Uh, I'm very familiar with this community. I'm, I recognize many faces, um, and uh, I've been. Uh, I was not involved in Max uh, in my previous job, but I was aware about all the activity, all the good stuff coming out of that project. Um, so today, people see me talking about multiple stuff. So today, I want to talk about what's harm, what harm is doing in the context of FPC high performance computing in the context of co-design. So because this session is about co-design, I will ex I will stress the concept about what ARM is doing or try to do with its own partner in this space. And uh, the objective of this talk is really try to convince you that, uh, you know, ARM is doing something extremely important, very active, is present, and uh, is somehow a force of change in, 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 this, in this environment. Um, before start, because uh, while I was talking with my colleague about what to put the presentation and what to introduce the whole concept, I naively guessed that everybody actually understands what ARM is and how ARM operates. So by raise of hands, since you've got all coffee, uh, who, the, who knows what ARM is and does? Okay, this is great. So I have, a, a, I'm not saying a couple of marketing slides about that, but I will basically introduce what ARM does and how ARM operates in the concept of high performance computing, uh, in particular the business model, because there's a little bit of confusion sometimes uh, about what ARM can give to the community straight away, rather than what the partner that ARM is working with can give to the community straight away. So uh, because this is about co-design, and uh, I've been following all the talk today, I want to start with what is the definition. I, I googled this, and I found this paper uh, about what co-design is in the view of the DOE back in US. Um, and I want to point out on one thing that it's probably most relevant to what harm is and how harm operated is actually the second part. I'm going to read it just to make sure that I can stress with the words, with the, the concept I want to transmit. So the code design strategy is based on developing partnership with computer vendors and application scientists and engaging them with a highly collaborative and iterative design process well before a given system is available for commercial use. So, ARM. Business model is produce intellectual property for building chip, for building CPU. We've been a market leader for the mobile market. We've been basically have a huge share, 87, 90, 95, depending on how you count it. But the reality is that we don't print the silicon. We are a design company from that point of view. We, we understand our CPU memory system work. We put together this building block and we give to a partner, someone that implement this in a real chip, CPU. Uh, a specific design they can eventually sell. So what business model is essentially to engage with these people, understand what they want, what they need, what type of workload they have, then work with them to create the best design for their use, they will create the product that is sold to someone. So I don't know, like if you take an Intel Nvidia example, they produce CPU and GPU, they sell it to you, and this is perfectly fine. ARM is like a different, it doesn't build the physical hardware directly, or at least with a few prototypes. But we design them with a partner, then then reach to you. Nevertheless, we want to be exposed to the final user because the whole idea of co-design is to come early in advance when there's the design of this element before even printed or before even realized. And then we have essentially different business models behind this, but I work for ARM Research and I'm more interested to actually the collaborative and partnership part rather than the, 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 or the licensing. And um, in the era of HPC, ARM is relatively new. I uh, will talk about, I will mention about one project Mont Blanc has been like a, opened the door about ARM into the HPC world, but what ARM brings uh, into the HPC market, I want to summarize into these three elements. Because of our heritage into the mobile space, ARM design is extremely power efficient. 
And uh, toward the years, we also create this big little type of architecture when there are core that are throughput optimized or core that are latency optimized that we can somehow mix, mix together in order to tackle specific workflow. I have to make an example with the mobile space when you, I don't know, when you browse internet on the mobile, uh, you probably are using a fast core. But when you play some game, when there is some graphic or some other compute behind the scene, we are using a lot of small core altogether. And these are all packed somehow into the same SOC. What Harm brings because of his business model is also a choice. So in principle, based on the same foundation that is essentially the ARM architecture, there are multiple vendors that produce silicon and you can buy from these multiple vendors different solutions based on your needs. And all of those may have different choices, being more optimized for something like a, know, the cloud or high performance computing or normal server and station. And uh, nevertheless, there's also, also a little bit of customization. We don't sell a uh, we, don't, we don't give the partner uh, a, a solution that is, uh, you know, fixed, but we give them building blocks. And so people may decide to take this building block, putting them together in different ways, and they produce a different outcome, or somehow even change some of them and produce and add some of their capability inside. So there's a high level of flexibility that, of course, may create a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty because you don't know exactly what you can get, but also gives you a lot of choice, a lot of flexibility, what you can achieve if the, the co-design process is done. I would say probably. So our strategy in the in the HPC is to essentially see the first supercomputer that is ARM enabled. And we want to do this with this idea of co-design, with this idea of partnership, and also to enable the ecosystem. And we started with several projects in the in the DOE in Japan and Europe, but we also start to essentially look at the software ecosystem. We start to look at what was missing in our tool chain, in our software stack, <laughs> in order to be in the high performance computing and to enable high performance computing application. But also, we want to work with you, work with people actually writing the application, because at the end, you have to use our technology. Indirectly, but you're going to use that. And so, we want to work with the application owner and user, or ISB in, in case of commercial application. So the co-design journey of ARM started with, uh, I don't know exactly when it started, I mean that I joined the company yesterday, three weeks ago, so I don't know what was before that. Since, since it's a company, a lot of things are not entirely public. But this is perfectly okay. But I'm talking about few initiatives that are public knowledge, so you can find plenty of material online. In Europe, since this is an European initiative, we have Mont Blanc that opened up the, 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 the door. It was for, they started with the mobile very, very aggressive. They started more or less when the same time when the first ARM 64-bit specifications come out, and then they evolved to a point where now they're looking for RSOC that are fully 64-bit, I would say mainstream and ready for production, that is the Cavium Thunder X2. And the building seven prototype, they build, they, they build in their programming model, they've been looking at libraries and the ecosystem application, but they've been working with ARM to understand it how to put together this system. Uh, in UK, through one of the recent funding uh, round about uh, the infrastructure, uh, instead of deploying a classic system, um, the GW4 consortium in uh, Bristol decided to deploy a system that is fully ARM-based with two specific purposes. Now, independently of which ARM technology is now is public, is uh, and the vendor that now is public is going to be Cray, but uh, the objective of this type of machine was, I compare Apple with Apple, up to the point I can actually do that. So if I try to make homogeneous as much as I can within that system, is the same vendor, is the same tool chain. You know, it's literally just the, the blade just accommodate a different chip. Maybe I can really compare how competitive is an ARM-based solution versus an alternative x 6 based solution. So it would be very interesting to see what this comparison uh, exercise is going to look like. And through probably praise through even through direct contact, it will be possible to access this platform and play with it. There is something going on also outside Europe, where probably there are different ways of entering with the funding and probably bigger, bigger, bigger ideas. Uh, it's public knowledge about Sandia involvement in trying to build a system based on ARM. Uh, they already have something in-house. They want to go further and bigger. Uh, there's no specification exactly about with which ARM implementation they're going to look like, but it's going to happen, they, and they want to target excess scale in that way. Who is going to apparently try to reach excess scale as quick as possible are the Japanese. They were using Spark as a technology, but then they decided that for various reasons, it was better to actually rely on the ARM implementation, and so they designed the post-K system as an ARM-enabled uh, uh, 
um, type of machine. And they're also dealing with their own interconnect and so on and so forth. The role of ARM in that specific project was design the scalable vector extension, the SV, that I will gladly mention what they are and how they work. So back in co-design, what I want to give it to you in the next well, no, 10 minutes is basically try to fill all the gaps. So as a harm where we operate on how we're operating in all these seven levels, starting from the application because, because, well, because you are application person. So starting from here, up down to what is the architecture and the platform. Uh, I, will, I will show some, uh, let's say, results. I will put some reference work that other people have been doing. This slide will be public so you can forward look into material. And, but I will not show benchmark because uh, even if I have them, I don't want to show that. I want to really <coughs> focus purely on this idea of co-design and how can, can, essentially we can, we can work together. So in terms of application arm, as soon as ARM64 machines started to appear, <coughs> both parties and both are still under non-disclosure agreement, uh, ARM started to engage with its partner to basically compile this application and see if they are working. And uh, to do that, essentially, we, we look at what applications are most common use, and uh, we basically try to run with the ARM toolchain, uh, with the GCC toolchain, and uh, we set up essentially a GitHub type of, uh, yeah, GitLab in this case, type of repository where uh, there is basically a description of how to compile code and essentially how to run them uh, using ARM64 ARM and some ARM64 compiler and library. And to be honest, as based on my knowledge, and I tried some of them, uh, there's no particular problem. 99.99% works out of the box because you just compile and rely on, on, on open source libraries. Uh, of course, we want to look at our software stack and we make tuning and enhancement in that respect. So application, you know, it's complex. We, we, we fault fancy, whatever it is, message passing, uh, various library. But, uh, you know, you, you, we code it and we need a set of tool <coughs> libraries, compiler to essentially enable them, enable the developer to actually do their work. So I don't know when exactly, but I pro it was probably last year, uh, we acquired Linear. There was a HPC company that was doing tool uh, for, for HPC. And we paired it up with the effort that we had internally on compiler and library to create a suite to basically give to the developer to build their application on future and current ARM64 enabled platform. So without entering the detail about what the tool are doing, of course, we support in debugger, profiler, we support the C, C++ <coughs> and Fortran compiler as well. Uh, we are essentially focused on uh, enabling as much as possible the standard. So, you know, for the of C++, we want to go, we have C++14 support. Uh, there probably will be planned for the future one. Same for Fortran, same for OpenMP. Uh, we want to, of course, going, going forward, enable these libraries to the features that are specific for the ARM64 architecture. We want to give performance libraries that are optimized, and we spend a few words on that, and the performance library that we care about, that we all care about, are the classic Blast, Lapa, FFT, and whatever it is. Um, because we know, and we're working with partners, some of these libraries will be tuned for specific implementation of the ARM architecture, and this is great. You're going to use the library linking that will work out of the box. And thanks to the linear effort and expertise, we have also tools that allow to, you know, identify like performance bottleneck, profiling spot, all the things that are parallel developer for scientific application usually usually do. So information are, are essentially there. Uh, at the very beginning, ARM didn't have a Fortran compiler. That was this time of Fortran enthusiastic. Um, so there was a big miss. So we pay up with PGI actually. So we we somehow working with them. And we implement uh, within our compiler tool chain PGI Flang. So now we can essentially, through our directory compiler, ingest Fortran and somehow generate binary that can run on the CPU. So, so far I mentioned what is what we consider ARM commercial compiler. Historically, ARM truly narrow, that is one of the branch uh, that is working together, that is working more into the software ecosystem. Uh, a lot of enhancement and improvement are upstream to the open source community, so in open source code, so GCC, LLVM, BLAS. So you can find a lot of libraries that are completely open source, completely free, that actually have enhancement optimization from ARM64. The reason why at some point we decide to go forward with our commercial compiler is because, well, if you're selling something, you need to have support. And at some point you want to, I'm not say blaming someone, but somehow be having a reference person that you can talk to and say, I have a bug, can you fix it? or I have a problem, can you support me? 
And this is very important, especially if we look at more of the commercial side of HPC rather than just the academic one. And um, so in terms of the future, we would basically go in on uh, adding new things, adding new optimization. In terms of hardware, it's been announced that 2016, the first SOC uh, that is going to become adopted by, by multiple partners, that is the Thunder X2. You can Google and find more specification. Last year, Qualcomm announced another chip, um, soon to be proven good for HPC, but another chip with a lot of core, enable 64, that's going to target the hyperscale in the HPC market. These two processors are somehow the ones that are going to be available this year for anyone who wants to play physically with ARM in, 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 into server, essentially, to deploy a proper server uh, and system. So in terms of having Thunder X2, because there are public results, and wherever I can, again, I have re results, uh, what was very important was that, uh, um, well, compared to what is on paper, we can actually squeeze a good amount of the real performance of the core using classic workload, for example, Jam, and then because we're working on our commercial compiler, so in improving the libraries, improving the compiler, we also have to have an advantage on our compiler, for example, in the maximum throughput or the maximum peak that we can reach on, on, on this specific workload. And this is the classical Jam, because this was easy. However, we didn't do it, but the GW4 consortium started to do it because they have this platform and they have already a test bed before the full system deployment. They start to compare Apple to Apple. So they compare Broadwell, Skylake, and the Thunder X2 across some of the workload. This is a single node because, well, they have only one now. Um, and you know, it's interesting, independently of what's the actually time of running this mini app, these are almost all mini app. Um, it's good to see that, uh, well, between Robo and Skylake, of course, there's a bump in performance, but in a lot of cases, Thunder X2 is very competitive. Then we can go down and looking, looking at the reason why this is happening, the single core throughput or the memory bandwidth. These are mostly actually memory bandwidth related type of benchmark. But this is a good sign that the thing is real. So if you buy, you can actually use it. This is great. One of the advantages they started to make the HPC um, community even more excited is this concept of scalar vector extension. So to make it very short, um, the idea is that uh, when you program vector instruction now through intrinsic or through an assembly, you have a fixed vector length. So you have like 256, 512. You have to align your data in this way or align the compiler to understanding that. So we realize that the partner may want to implement this in a different way. Um, because they think that their customer, they have different needs. That's perfectly fine. But uh, design a nice, uh, design a core that will accommodate all possible vector extension is simply madness. It takes too much effort and it's not really, it also makes the software side more complicated to optimize and build, so the compiler and the library. So we came up with the idea of vector length agnostic. So the assembly that the compiler can generate doesn't have any knowledge of the vector extension but somehow is marked to the hardware when the one provider decided the vector left on my chip is gonna be, for example, 512. So all of these from an application point of view, what does it mean? Well, you can still implement tricks in the software and this is great, and we can still take your workload and analyze how effective is mapped to this console of SV by varying the vector length. But at the end, from a code generation perspective, we can put a lot of risk in the compiler and the libraries, and they will simply work well, or good enough, in multiple implementation of the software. And we don't know which, which vector lens our partner is gonna go into adopt. It's not really under our control. So this cost of agnostic, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, this, is a, this is, again, a, a, another word that you can look into the detail. This has been done in the context of Mont Blanc. SV hardware is not available at the moment, so we need to use emulator to understand how the workload actually behave. Here, the idea of co-design. And basically, we take some of the typical small workload uh, from, uh, you know, that's maybe jam, this is all other mini benchmark. And we basically, in the simulator, try to vary the vector length of some of these simulated system and see how much throughput gain we can get in that respect. And this is a good feedback in terms of co-design about what you can do if you make an hardware, a, a design, a hardware design decision rather than another. So today, because there's no, not yet SV-enabled hardware, 
what we have as a harm for, our, for the people who want to work with us is essentially a compiler and emulator that extract a lot of information and heuristic about your code and allow to essentially browse what is the code and also the assembler and understand, you know, when things happen or when things does not happen, so there is, there is something that prevents, for example, vectorization. A uh, work very similar to this has been done actually by Yulip. Here is the person that can talk about this much more in detail. It has been presented both for supercomputing and both for high peak last week, where essentially they took several applications, they extract part of the workload, they run our tool, and they'll be looking essentially understanding if this application can be mapped to SV, when SV is going to be available, and how much gain or performance improvement we can, we can get. And they've been using several techniques I believe both automated and semi-automated in order to, to estimate the performance that, to be honest, are kind of very low level compared to the general application development. But still, this is the something as close as possible to the hardware that then can feed into the design of the next SOC. So this is very interesting. I believe that they are very much very continuing. So just to close a little bit, um, a question that people ask me, they were asking me already before I would even join ARM, Okay, I want to play with ARM. I need an ARM machine anyway. I cannot play with an emulator, you know, forever. So, machines that have ARM64 core are starting to appear, and more and more will come. So, these are three references of machines that already exist. You can buy out of the box. You cannot have to come to us. That's the they send the message. We don't have them. You have to go to some of your vendors. The work you were close with within the center, or uh, yes, within your center. And uh, independently by the platform, what is very important is that ARM wants to enter and start to build relationship with the community. Because if we go again at this co-design idea, we have to feed back into the hardware design. And since we are, I mean, not just me said, but the entire company, hardware architect, we want to understand better what the final user wants to have in order to make hardware choice, design choices that will impact the partner and so our user. So to do that, we are running multiple events where people talk about their experience with ARM on major supercomputing conference. We have, uh, now we have a Google group. We have some GitLab pages where we put receipt and uh, how to build your application and, and run. That's what we are as well. And uh, our role essentially is to, you know, to talk with you, help if you get any problem to actually compile and run. Uh, we work together to isolate what is very representative from your application and we can reuse for the next stages. And eventually help also to what is, let's say, most of the testing and understanding that there is continuous coverage of our tool and our compiler as soon as your code evolves. And um, yeah, that's all. If you have any questions, I'm over here. Thank you.